Well, good morning to each one. So good to be with you on this first day of the week to assemble together to worship God in spirit and in truth. I invite you to take your Bibles out, please. Be open to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Well, I appreciate those who filled in for me in my absence and the gospel meeting I had in Kentucky. I worked Brother Gentry kind of hard. He preached last Sunday morning and, of course, taught class Wednesday night in my absence. Also thankful that Jacob Jordan was able to come and, uh, of course, one of the men that we regularly support. He was able to come and, and give a lesson on last Sunday evening. But it's good to be back. Had a really good week in Shepherdsville, Kentucky there. And was treated very warmly and kindly. It was not very nice to have April and the kids there with me on Sunday. But, of course, with school responsibilities and other such matters, they had to get back and came back Monday. But uh, it's good to be back myself. We have visitors in our midst, and we're so thankful for your presence, especially encouraged by you being here. Let's read together in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Paul to Timothy writes, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And so the aged Apostle Paul, and when we get to the fourth chapter, he speaks of his impending death, writes to the younger evangelist, and as he refers to Timothy as his son, not in the flesh, but in the faith, but a very close relationship with Timothy. He reminds them of the things that he had heard from Paul and from many witnesses that he would take those teachings of Christ from Paul and then pass that on, commit these to faithful men. In other words, faithful men in the Lord's church. And so that, that teaching process continues from older generation to younger generation to those that have been converted and uh, those who are grounded teach them and they can continue to, then they can teach others. And he gives three illustrations that they could relate to then and we can appreciate and relate to now. He speaks of the soldier, he speaks of the athlete, and he speaks, uh, speaks to the farmer. But I want to, for our lesson this morning, focus more on what he says there in verse 5. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. I want to kind of focus our attention on that phrase, according to the rules. Athletes who compete in sports and athletics, they do not receive the ribbon, the crown, the medal, the accolades, the trophy, unless they compete according to the rules. And if they do receive it and later find out they didn't, we know of many examples, even in recent times, where they are stripped of that medal or that trophy, that recognition. I want to think about that word rules, rules as defined, a prescribed guide for conduct or action, a legal precept or doctrine. It's also defined as the laws or regulations prescribed by the founder of a religious order for observance by its members. And then in the free dictionary, it has this definition, an authoritative prescribed direction for conduct 
especially one of the regulations governing procedure in a legislative body or a regulation observed by the players in a game, sport, or contest. Well, you think about rules, there must be someone who gives those rules. Someone in an authoritative position to give those rules. In fact, that second definition kind of alludes to that. The laws or regulations prescribed by the founder of a religious order for observance by its members. Well, of course, we have a spiritual ruler to obey, and that's Jesus Christ. And notice he's described as being not the foot, but the head of the body, the church. There's many scriptures that bring that out, but just let's highlight a few of those now. In Ephesians chapter 1, notice with me there in verses 22 and 23, please. And he put all things under his feet. God did this for his son, Jesus. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head, notice, over all things to the church, which his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. You come to chapter 5 of Ephesians. Jason touched on this just a little bit in class this morning where we have the husband and wife, the marriage relationship being discussed, but the overriding emphasis, Paul says, is I'm talking about Christ and his bride, the church. But we have these connections and comparisons made for us to help us with both of those. But in verses 23 and 24... Paul says, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And that makes sense. He's the head. He's the head of the church, and if we're the church, we're the body. Members make up the church. Then he leads us, he guides us, he directs us. We are to submit to him, be in subjection to him in everything. And so when he gives rules, when he gives orders to be followed, when he gives instructions and guidelines, we must abide by those. In Colossians chapter 1, notice what Paul says to the church in Colossae in verse 18. When he writes, and he, speaking of Christ, is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, and then notice this last statement, that in all things he may have what? He may have the preeminence. What does that word preeminence mean? It means first place, supremacy. He has first place in everything. Why? Because he is the head of the body, the church. You think about what Jesus said to his disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, he said, All authority has been given to me, where? In heaven and on earth. Paul says if one competes in athletics, he must compete according to the rules if he's going to be crowned. Well, there's rules. But we need to think about, first of all, who it is who gives those rules that we as Christians are to follow. And of course, that's Jesus Christ. He's the head of the body of the church. He is the shepherd of the sheep. And the sheep are to follow and obey and listen to the voice of the shepherd. Even in prophecy about Jesus, it speaks of his role as a ruler, as the shepherd. When the wise men come seeking the king of the Jews and they come to King Herod of Judea, Herod asks, the scribes where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him in verse 5, In Bethlehem of Judea, and then they quote from Micah the prophet in verse 6, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall notice come what? A ruler. And what will this ruler do? He will shepherd my people Israel. A ruler is going to come out of Bethlehem of Judea, and of course that would be Jesus, and what is he going to do? He's going to shepherd my people because he's the shepherd of the sheep. In fact, in John's gospel, Jesus said one of those great I am statements of John's gospel, I am the good shepherd. He describes himself, identifies himself. The good shepherd does what? He gives his life for the sheep. Verse 11, verse 14. 
I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. In fact, he's referred to in the context of dealing with elders in the church as the chief shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He's number one in charge of shepherds. And so he must be followed. He must be listened to and heeded and obeyed. Jesus, of course, is the king of his kingdom. And so if there's rules given, it's given by the king. It's given by the head of the church. It's given by the shepherd. In Luke chapter 1, again in prophecy, as we think about the angel's visit, angel Gabriel's visit to Mary, and concerning the child she would conceive, the son she would conceive of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that is said here by the angel Gabriel to Mary concerning the child Jesus, and he shall, verse 33, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And notice, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Right before that, it talks about how the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So there's the throne of his father David, and he has a kingdom, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Throne, king, kingdom. In fact, when Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who Jesus stood before, leading up to his crucifixion, asked him if he was a king, remember? Well, before he asked him that, Jesus said to him in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. He tells Pilate, I have a kingdom and it's not of this world. My king, if, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. But even though it's not from here, even though it's not earthly, he has a kingdom, doesn't he? And if he has a kingdom, it implies that he's what? He's king. He's ruler. Pilate said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am am a king. He says, in fact, for this cause I was born. And for this cause I've come to the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You see the authority there? I am a king with a kingdom for this cause. I was born and that everyone who is of the truth, what do they do? They hear my voice because I'm the ruler, right? He's king of kings. Lord of Lords, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 tells us that. Well, obviously if there's a spiritual ruler to obey, the spiritual ruler gives us spiritual rules to follow. You know, when you think about that phrase from 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, unless he competes according to the rules, that phrase implies that there's a standard, right? Right? that must be followed. And that standard, as we're appealing to, is the Word of God. It's the teachings and the commandments of Jesus Christ, our head, our shepherd, our king. But there in Matthew 28, we, we just mentioned verse 18 where Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He talks about to his disciples, not just talks about, commands them to go make disciples of all nations, Right? baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse 20, those you've made disciples and baptized, teaching them to observe what? All things that I have commanded you. Well, there's that head there, the shepherd, the king, who gives the rules to be followed and obeyed. And we are to observe as his disciples, and that's many of us here gathered this morning who have already obeyed the gospel and are presently disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to obey, observe all things He's commanded us in His Word, in the New Covenant. Jesus says, if we love Him, we'll do that. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. The next chapter, John 15, 14. He says, you are my friends if what? If you do whatever I command you. What if I don't do whatever He commands me? Then I'm not a friend of Jesus. That basis for that relationship and that fellowship and that communion with Jesus Christ is indeed connected to my willingness and hopefully happiness, cheerfulness to do whatever he commands me. Paul would write to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 2, 
For you know what commandments we gave you, notice, through the Lord Jesus. It was by the authority of Jesus we gave you those commandments because he's the head, he's the shepherd, he's the king that must be obeyed. Later in the New Testament, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, we read there, Now by this we know that we know him. Well, what's the basis of knowing that we know him? John says, if we keep his commandments. You mean if I don't keep his commandments, I don't really know him? That's correct. God has revealed himself to us in his word from the very beginning he gave man instructions and woman instructions to follow and obey in order to have that relationship with him, that fellowship with him, and to know him. But if I don't know his commandments and don't keep his commandments, then I do not know him. 1 John 3, 24, now he who keeps his commandments, notice, abides in him and he in him. And then in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not Burdensome. This is love that we walk according to his commandments, 2 John verse 6. And so it's a, kind of a repeated theme when you say uh, in the New Testament concerning those commandments, those rules, instructions, different synonyms for the same point we're making here that have been given to us by God, that have been given to us by his son, Jesus Christ. And since he's our spiritual ruler, we must submit to those rules and do according to those rules. And we need to step back and, and think about why has he given us those commandments, those rules to follow? Just because he's all powerful and he's created us and so he's the creator, we're the creation and so we must obey him. Well, there, that's tr there's truth to that. But certainly there's purpose to his commandments. These rules are for our good. We go back to the Old Testament and Israel was told the same thing. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 40. And then we'll notice also a verse in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy as well. But Deuteronomy chapter 4 and in verse 40. You shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today. Notice that it may go well with you, uh, that it may go well with you and with your children after you. So it's for your benefit, it's for your sons and daughters' benefit. And notice, and that you may prolong your days in the land which your Lord, your God, has given you for all time. It's for your benefit that you would keep his statutes, his commandments, which you command today. In chapter 5 and verse 33, we read, You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. So, in essence, expressing the same point of Deuteronomy 4.40. And then notice with me in the book of Psalms, let's go to Psalm 19, and then we'll look at some verses from Psalm 119, but first, go to Psalm 19, please. Here's one of the many psalms of the sweet psalmist David. And in verses 7 through 11, notice how David describes God's words, how he describes the law. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? How is it for our good? He says, converting or restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What does it do for us? Making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. We know that. But what does it also do for us? Rejoicing the heart. It brings us joy. The commandment of the Lord is pure. It enlightens the eyes, David says. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them, here's the great benefit, there is great reward. So all throughout those verses, David speaking of the law, 
speaking of the law of the Lord, speaking of the testimony of the Lord, speaking of the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. With that, he talks about all the good it does for us. When we know them, when we keep them, when we follow them, the benefit to us and how sweet it should be even to our, our taste. Psalm 119, verse 98. You, through your commandments, notice the psalmist says, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. And then in Psalm 119, in verse 143, trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. Think about the contrast, trouble, anguish, delights. But what brings the delights? I don't think a lot of people in the religious world and maybe sometimes in the church think about God's commandments and delights together, but the psalmist did. And that was in the law of Moses. We're in the new covenant, the better covenant, established on better promises. How should our attitude be toward God's commandments, the Lord's commandments in the New Testament then? We read in Psalm 119, verse 151, all your commandments are truth. And in verse 172, all your commandments are righteousness. And then coming over to the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, that comes from the Old Testament, but it's stated in the New Testament as well. And we're reminded of the promise. You do this, young people. You do this, children. It's for your benefit to have a longer life. You look at all the trouble that so many young people get themselves into. Uh, sadly, so many of the broken homes and the terrible, sad situations and circumstances that so many children are being brought up in and raised in, with the drugs and alcohol and abuse and divorce, and, and, or even in a home where you, you have father and mother, but there's not the honor and the respect and the obedience that Paul speaks of here in this passage. And those young people get themselves into so much trouble in this world, but those raised in a godly home who have that respect, that honor for their parents, what it does for them. Notice with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 14 through 17. But you must continue in the things which you have learned, Paul says to Timothy, and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Notice the next statement, knowing the Holy Scriptures, which are what? Able to make you wise for salvation. Would you say that's for our good? Here's the greatest good that we can do for our children. We were blessed with about 30 or more right now from baby up to high school. I'm not even including our wonderful college students. But from babies to high school, we have around, we're blessed with about 30 children, young people here. And parents, moms and dads, the best thing we can do for our children is from childhood to help make them know the Holy Scriptures which are able to make them wise for salvation, their souls, their eternal souls. And yes, it's for our good that we're given these rules, these commandments, these teachings found in God's Word that we may be with God and Christ and the angels, the Holy Spirit, the redeemed for all eternity and that we can be there with our loved ones in that place. And he goes on to say, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And notice, it's profitable, it's for our good it's profitable, it's beneficial for doctrine or teaching, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete for our good. Again, thoroughly equipped or furnished unto every good work. If you go with me to 1 Timothy 4, one more passage on this point, even though we could give many more. I want to move on to some additional points. But 1 Timothy 4, 16 at the end of chapter 4, notice what Paul says to Timothy. Take 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, to the teachings, right? Continue in them, for in doing this, what will happen? You will save both yourself and those who hear you. 
we have a spiritual ruler, it's Jesus Christ. We have spiritual rules that we are given to follow, but these rules we need to stop and, and think about, they're, they're, they've always been for our good. They've always been for our benefit to, to have that relationship with God, to have a better life, a longer life, and ultimately eternal life. You know, sadly though, too often there's wrong attitudes that men and women have toward God's rules. And here's some of them. Well, God's rules are just too hard. They're too difficult to keep and to obey and to follow. They're too burdensome. From our scripture, well, actually, we're not to our scripture reading yet. We'll be there in Ezekiel. But before that, go to Isaiah with me, please. Isaiah chapter 28. And verse 13. Notice how God's word was to the people. Their attitude towards it. But the word of the Lord was to them. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. They might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. And he goes on to say, Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. But that's how the word of God became to them. Kind of like that Malachi 1.13 going up to worship God. Oh what, a, oh, what a weariness this is. That's what it had become to them. Just a commandment over another commandment. Here's another commandment, line upon line. And so they didn't obey it. They had a rebellious attitude and heart towards God's will. In Ezekiel chapter 18, let's go there please. Ezekiel 18. <clears throat> I would back you up. In the text, please, to verse 23. He says, Do I have any pleasure at all? Verse 23 of Ezekiel 18. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does not and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. Yet you say, here's the verse, verse 25, Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and dies in it, is it because of the iniquity which... It is because, excuse me, of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair in your ways which are not fair. And that's the truth of it. But people had that attitude back then, some of God's own people, sometimes members of the Lord's church do, certainly I think we see that in the religious world as well. As, you know, God's rules, or at least some of them, they're just they're too difficult. Line upon line, precept upon precept, God's ways are not fair. No, we better check ourselves on that. No, let God be true and every man a liar, as Paul said in Romans. No, if, if anyone's unfair, it, it's us, like Israel of old was charged with. We read this passage earlier. We had it up on, the, on one of our slides, 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are what? Not burdensome, right? They, do they ever challenge us? You better be, be, better be for sure. They do. They challenge us, maybe to our very core to keep them, but too hard and burdensome and difficult and heavy to keep? No. And because of our love for God, whatever that commandment is, 
upon us individually or as a local church, we're going to keep those things because we love him. Another wrong attitude toward God's rules. God's rules are open to interpretation. After all, we're not going to understand the Bible alike. So you interpret it one way, and I understand that passage a different way. And no, that's not, that's not correct. That's not right. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we read there, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So take that out. That argument won't work. For prophecy never came by the will of man, where did it come from? But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so even what we hold in our hand is, you know, it's, it's, it's not by interpretation of just mere men and what they think and feel and the conclusions they reach. No, they, these are holy men of God guided divinely by the Holy Spirit. And they spoke and they wrote with that divine influence and guidance. And then... In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Think about it. If he really desires all men to be saved, and his ways are not unfair, and he shows no partiality, and we have to know the truth in order to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, and Jesus said, You, you shall know the truth, truth shall set you free, then he's got to give us truth that we can understand. He's got to give us rules and commandments and instructions that we can read and come to an understanding. And that's the expectation, expectation as Paul writes Ephesians 5, 17. Therefore, don't be unwise or foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And that's why Paul could write 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. No, God's rules are not open to interpretation. We need to read them, understand them, follow them, be united upon them. Another wrong attitude towards God's rules. Well, God's rules, they change with the times. You know, this is an old book. This is ancient. And so it's kind of out of date. It's not up with the times. And some people actually have that attitude because, I mean, we're talking about thousands of years removed, right? Especially when you get back to the Old Testament, thousands and thousands of years removed, those things written there. And so it really doesn't speak to my life and, and, and your life and what we're going through now in the 21st century. I mean, we're talking first century here with the New Testament and even for way further back with the Old Testament. And, and, and so we have to evolve and change with the times. A lot of churches take that kind of mindset and they're ever evolving, changing practices and doctrines that they hold to. But we need to understand that God's rules do not change with the times. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the charge is given, don't add and don't take away from my words. And Paul says, and even repeats it in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, that even if we or an angel from heaven preached you a different gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. As I've said to you before, so I now say again, if anyone, verse 9, preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Things are not to change and be changed. If we do, we're accursed from God and will suffer terrible consequences, as this passage in Revelation brings out. And when we think about God's Word, no, His rules and His instructions and His Word doesn't change. It endures and abides forever. He doesn't change. His Word does not change. Malachi 3, 6, God does not change, and His Word does not change. 1 Peter 1, 23-25. You know, another point from that passage, our opening passage in Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 about the athlete, says, and also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes, what? According to the rules. In other words, cheaters will not be crowned. You gotta, must compete according to the rules. You know, Jesus brings it up in that kind of judgment uh, scene or uh, he, he presents to us at near the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, 
beginning in verse 21, when he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, think about it. That's kind of a synonym for according to the rules. But he who does what? Does the will of my Father in heaven. Those who obey God's will. Those are the ones that will be in heaven. Not just because you're religious and sincere and you say, Lord, Lord, and you call me, and you identify me. Jesus, you're my Lord. Verse 22, in fact, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Notice this last part. You who what? Practice lawlessness. You're doing things contrary to my law, to my rules, to my commandments. And so you're not competing according to the rules. Now, whether they're intentionally cheating or not, some people intentionally do it. Some just don't know the rules. They're ignorant of the rules. They've been deceived by others. We, we understand that. It's not just people who are... Uh, doing that intentionally. There's plenty of people that are sincerely deceived, right? But the bottom line is we're either doing the will of God or we're not. If we're not, we're practicing lawlessness. That's, you know, Jesus made that point with the scribes and Pharisees over in Matthew 15 with their praise of God and their, the worship they offered to God. Remember, he calls them hypocrites and he quotes from Isaiah prophecy and applies it to them. These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. Notice why their worship is vain. Well, their heart's not in it. Uh, but also they are teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Well, that's not, the, that's not God's rules. Those are man's rules. That's not divine authority, heaven's authority. That's earthly authority and that does not save and that does not cause us to be received by the Lord. We see it again in Romans chapter 10 when Paul says that he, I bear them witness when it came to Israel, when it came to the, his Jewish brethren in the flesh, uh, his prayer, his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they may be saved. Verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but notice it's not according to knowledge, not the knowledge of God's will. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, what do they seek to do? They seek to establish their own righteousness. They're not, they're not competing according to the rules of God then. Because they're ignorant of God's righteousness, they, they seek to establish their own righteousness, and notice they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They haven't submitted to His word, His law. And then notice in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What happened? Well, it's kind of like going back to the wrong attitude towards God's word. Whether that attitude was, you know what, I think some of God's commandments are too difficult or burdensome. or they, I, think, I think we can understand that a little bit differently than how brethren have understood and been preaching on that for years. And so we want to alter that. They have these itching ears. According to what? Their own desires. And so they're going to heap up for themselves teachers. They turn their ears away from what? From the truth, from the rules of God, from the commandments and doctrine of Christ. And, and they're turned aside to fables, things that are false and fake. And they're not going to be crowned if that's the way they go. We must abide by all the rules to win. We must strive to do that. Not some or most of the rules of God not just the ones we want to keep and the ones we like and the ones we don't really want to do, set those aside. And at the same time, understand we're not speaking about perfection. No, we need a Savior to save us from our sins. But He has given us His law, His doctrine to keep. And He expects us to keep it since He is the head and He is the shepherd and He is the king. We are to obey Him 
in all things. But there will be times we recognize this, that I'm going to fall short, and you're going to fall short, but he's a merciful high priest. He's sympathizing, and we repent, and we are determined to do better and to grow and mature in Christ. I don't know if that needs to be said, but I want to say it just in case someone goes away with the wrong idea, either now or later when they listen to the sermon. Say, well, you've got to keep all these rules, 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 rules. Well, God's rules, what He says. We, str we must strive to do that. What do, we, what do we notice in Matthew 28, 20? Teaching them to what? Observe all things that I've commanded you. But if you don't feel like it, if you don't feel like keeping some of those, that's okay. No, that's not in there. And in Acts chapter 3, when... Peter, in his second sermon, he quotes from a prophecy from Deuteronomy 18 that where Moses says, God one day is going to raise up a prophet like unto me whom the people must hear in all things. Well, Peter takes that prophecy and rightly applies it to Jesus Christ and him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you, the end of verse 22 of Acts 3, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed among the people. And so at the same time, I'm not trying to water this down either. Okay? We don't go to extremes. We've got to, we're going to keep this to per perfection. We strive for that. But at the same time, we don't minimize it and say, well, you know, you, you kind of do the best you can, but if you can't, no. We must obey him in whatever he says in all things. And if we, if we don't, we're going to be utterly destroyed. We're going to face his wrath. This is very serious. And whatever we do in word or deed must be all by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority. All, whatever we do, that's kind of all-inclusive, isn't it? We must abide in the doctrine of Christ to have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And if we don't, we don't have fellowship with them. And as Paul said, near the end of his life, we want to be able to say this too, that we have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. The faith of who? Jesus Christ. And because of that, there's reward. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We got to fight the good fight. We have to finish the race. We have to keep the faith in order to win, in order to receive the crown and be rewarded. You know, Jesus Christ said to the saints in Smyrna as they're facing persecution and would be soon, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. What does that mean, be faithful? Be faithful. Well, I, I don't think it's just one thing, as you think about all-encompassing as the life of a Christian, living the life we're called to live and holiness and our conduct. And, but just overall, there's faithfulness to the Lord and His teachings. And in, in, in my marriage and as a, as a parent and as a disciple of Christ and my function and in, in, in roles in the church and as a neighbor and everything, faithful to, to Christ until the end, to his word, to his doctrine. But notice what is said, at least one key aspect of that in Revelation 14 in verses 12 and 13, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. What did they do? They were abiding by the rules. They kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so those who die in the Lord in such a state, they may rest now from their labors. Their works follow them. They will receive one day that crown of eternal life. Let me ask you, have you obeyed Jesus' rules of salvation? If not, why not? Have you obeyed his instructions, his commands, his conditions of salvation? to hear his word as he calls upon us to do in John 5, 24 and many other passages to hear him. And not just to hear him, but as he speaks at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, he who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. A lot of people hear the words of Jesus and then they don't do anything about them and with them. 
We're talking about to be saved. We've got to hear Him and then, of course, act upon what we hear and believe in Him that He is the Christ, the Son of God. And if we don't believe in Him, Jesus says, you'll die in your sins. And He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And so He instructs us. He commands us. He, he, he pleads and implores that we would repent so we won't be lost. And that we would confess him before men, Matthew 10, 32, because with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confess the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and be baptized in him. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who disbelieves shall be condemned. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if you haven't become a disciple of Jesus Christ yet because you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, met those conditions, why not do that this morning? If you have done those things, but there's sin in your life, and as a child of God, you, you recognize that, then repent of that, confess that, pray about that. But if we can assist you in your spiritual needs this morning, let, us, let that be known as together we stand and we sing.